Hey everybody, welcome to church this evening, so good to see you, whether it's your first time here or perhaps watching online at home, um, or you've been coming along for many, many years, it's so good to see you, my name's Tom, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, it is wet, it's unseasonably cold and grey for mid-May, but here is some wonderful news to begin our time with this evening, God loves you, God loves you. And I wonder if you're a follower of Jesus here this evening, whether you've ever paused just to grasp just how great is God's love for you. It's not, it's not mild interest. It's not half-hearted affection. It is deep and wide and long and high. In fact, it is so vast the love that God has for us. We can only grasp it by God's power at work in us. Remember those remarkable verses that we considered last week if you were here in Ephesians chapter 3? Paul writes this, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge he loves you. He loves you. And isn't that a great place to begin this evening as we prepare our hearts to sit under the word of God, to rest in the rich and relentless love of God for us. So let's pray as we begin, as we rejoice in that wonderful truth before we sing. Let's pray. Uh, loving Father in heaven, we do thank you so much for your great, extravagant love for us. Please forgive us for where we've grown cold to that perhaps this week. And we ask that tonight as we come and as we sit under your word as your people, please be at work in our hearts. Please soften them that we might grasp all the more just how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ for us. And we ask this for our joy and that it might be to the praise of your glorious grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
generations fall, but his word is living and his word is shining. so much guys we can't wait to sing with you hopefully not too long um, we've got so much to thank God for haven't we his love for us as we just considered his promises that are sure and certain as we were just singing about every spiritual blessing that he has given us in Christ Jesus Ephesians 1 from right at the beginning of this series and so we're going to respond now by praying together the prayer of thanksgiving words are going to be on the screen let's pray this prayer together with thankfulness in our hearts for all that God has done for us in Christ together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Now we often at this point of our gathering profile one of our ministries that's going on across the church family, and uh, we're going to watch... A short video from our instruct ministry letting us know what's going on across the life of the church and then Rianne's going to come and lead us in prayer. This week we are hearing an update from the instruct ministry for our ministry focus lot and it's my privilege to lead that team, the instruct team, with a wonderful group of trainers, team leaders. Kathy Dalton is the ministry advisor and we've been reflecting this past year, there's been so much going on in different ways and yet what God has told us he's committed to doing hasn't changed. He's committed to building his church, that the gates of hell will not overcome it. And Ephesians 4 tells us that God's goal is that we should all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And in the daytime we've been hearing about Christ, the one who fills everything fully full with the fullness of God. And it's an amazing thing that God is committed to making us mature, to be more like, more fully mature in him. And it's easy in our church life to get very familiar with that. But what we are saying is week by week, as somebody gets up at the front on a Sunday and, and opens up the Bible and preaches, we are hearing God's word. The Instruct Ministry is committed to helping us to hear God's word. We do it all together uh, on, on a Sunday. But of course, we do it at all sorts of other points in the week too. Um, and we hear God's word and we seek to apply it to the many different situations of life that we find ourselves in. So just recently we've heard a, um, a teaching series thinking about issues of gender and the confusion, identity, good news for real life. We'd love as a church family to be hearing God's word and applying it to the difficult situations that we all face. And we'll have more opportunities to think about that in the coming year because, Lord willing, next term we hope to begin a Theology for Life program, bringing the, the deep and glorious truths of God to our ordinary life and experience and that new building will give us opportunities to do that which we're really looking forward to 
But we also know that hearing God's word and responding is not something we can just do on our own as individuals. Actually, it's something we do as a community, uh, together. And so we've got many small groups that meet that are organized to help us hear and apply God's word, but in the context of real relationship. And again, as, as we look to the summer and look ahead to the autumn, this is something we would love to encourage everybody who is part of our church family to consider. And whether it's part of a, an existing small group that you're in, or maybe you know you've never quite um, connected with a group, um, or, or in terms of Christian friends who can help you hear and, and, and apply God's word, we think this next season of life gives us a great opportunity to reset and have a go. So I would love to say, if you know you've been around church for a while, and maybe you have done a, a Connect course or something like that, but you know you've never quite settled into a group, a, a formal small group, or even just a kind of friendship group that's looking at the Bible, we would love to hear from you. Info at dundonald.org, because we would love to make it possible for everybody in our church family to hear God's word, apply it, but in the context of friendship, relationship, and maybe a small group. Um, so if you would like something like that, if you know this past year, you haven't been able to hear, hear and apply God's word in that kind of community context, please let us know. But also, we're very aware God has been doing wonderful things in different ways, and people have tried different things. And if you have had an experience of being part of a group and engaging with God's word this year, please let us know what God has done to encourage and teach you, because we want to learn and we want to take every opportunity as they come. But we do that remembering that God is committed to helping us grow to reach the full measure of the stature of Christ. And that's what the Instruct Ministry is here to help us to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for bringing us here tonight, whether we have been many times before and call this church family, or if this is our very first time at church. I pray that you would help us to learn more about you tonight, be encouraged by all that you give us and have done for us, and be challenged to live our lives differently because of it. As we look ahead to the coming term, we pray for more opportunities to be hearing and growing in our knowledge of you through your word, the Bible. Thank you that with the restrictions lifting, it gives us more opportunities to share our lives together as a church family. Please help us, wherever we are at with our faith, to honestly share the struggles, but also the joys of living for Jesus, our saviour. Thank you so much for the faithful preaching we receive here at Dundonald. We pray for our pastors and that Sunday preaching would always exalt and glorify Jesus and build us up together, especially with the current programs in Colossians in the morning and Ephesians here in the evenings. Thank you that we can pray to you about anything. We ask that you might hold unswervingly, that we might hold unswervingly to you, even in our doubts and uncertainties, which may feel particularly, we may feel particularly at the moment. Thank you so much that you are always faithful, even when your people are not. Thank you for all of the exciting plans for training over the summer in preparation for the um, opening of our new building. Please give us sacrificial hearts and a real desire to serve you and use the new building for your good, so that your church may be built up and we would grow in maturity to be more like your son. Now we pray for Danielle, our mission partner, serving as a UCCF staff worker in London, supporting students at Kingston and Roehampton Christian Unions. We pray that these students would be bold in sharing their faith with their friends. And we pray that those exploring Christianity would come to know the freedom and life-giving salvation found in Jesus. Thank you for Forum London, a training event for Christian unions that took place yesterday in person with over 65 students and equipped them for sharing the good news of Jesus. Thank you for Danielle's session and the time she put in to prepare. We pray that many would have found it helpful. 
And we do continue to pray for Danielle and all of the Christian unions around the country as they plan for September to welcome new students from all over the world. And we pray for wisdom and creativity as Danielle thinks through the implications of, of COVID for the new year. Please help them to keep their eyes and focused, focus on you and sharing what you have done for them as Christians in sending Jesus to be our savior. We do also pray for our Christian brothers and sisters all around the world. Please help those who are currently facing persecution. Help them to persevere and push on despite facing hostility, feeling afraid or beaten down. Please protect them from harm. And please let them be an example to us in whatever context we are in, to be bold and to stand firm in you, in the face of hatred, in the sure hope that we will be saved. And as we come to hear from your living word now, please help us to concentrate and help us to live our lives as you command, to be humble, gentle, patient, and to bear with one another in love. Thank you that in everything, you have promised to always be with us until the very end of the age. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. If you've got a Bible, you might like to grab hold of it now and turn to Ephesians chapter four. We're carrying on this series in Ephesians and we're about halfway through and we're reading this evening Ephesians chapter four, verse one through 16. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, this is the living word of God. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Evening, everybody. Really good to see you. If we've uh, not met before, my name is Richard Coken. I'm a senior pastor here, which just means I'm old. And uh, it's very nice to, to see you this evening. Let's begin with prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, we do thank you that your spirit continues to speak to us today through the words of the Bible. And so whether we're very new to these things or very familiar with them, we pray you'd help us to listen to your voice now. Help us to see what you're saying to us. Help us to concentrate, to understand, <clears throat> and to see how we could respond. 
for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just a, a question for us as we begin. How will Christ grow our church? Actually, come to think of it, how do churches grow? Uh, I mean, that's a vital question for every church and perhaps especially for us as we get ready to move back into our new building. How will God grow our church? We've been learning from Ephesians that uh, God's eternal plan is to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Chapter 1, verse 10. So that's the big long-term plan, bring everything together under the rule of Christ. And that in his church, 3.10 says, this manifold wisdom of God should be made known. In other words, the big plan to bring everything under Christ will be obvious from what happens in the church. So God wants his churches to manifest the wisdom of his plans by continually gathering people together from all nations under the rule of Christ. So he wants his churches to grow in number and in Christ-likeness. Now some people think that talking about church growth is worldly and wicked. And of course, if we're interested in church growth because we want to boast or to gain power or to be popular, then it is wicked. But when you think about it, God wants more people to be saved, and so he does want his church to grow, driven by love that wants to see people saved and to see God glorified. So we do need to talk about church growth because God wants to grow our church. So what does God want us to do to serve him in growing our church in the way that he wants to? Well, there are lots of places we could learn. We could learn from church growth studies. Lots of books have been written about how God has grown churches in the past. Uh, they often talk about having a compelling vision for the future, inspiring leadership. We well, can pray for that. Committed membership, self-reflecting humility, flexible structures, all good things. But some of those principles could grow a business just as much as a church. What must we do to ensure spiritual growth in Christ-likeness? Well, we can learn from other churches. That's certainly a good thing to do. Uh, for example, from the evangelistic strategies of community outreach that were established under the leadership of a great preacher called John Stott, who was at All Souls, uh, Langham Place in central London. There's lots to learn from the things that he established there or the value of sustained expository Bible preaching that was modelled by Dick Lucas at St. Helens Bishopsgate, another church in London. There's lots to learn from him. Or the commitment to training up gospel workers developed by Philip Jensen at St. Matthias in Sydney. We've learnt lots from that church. Or perhaps the strategic thinking of Tim Keller at Redeemer Church in New York. We've learnt lots from what God has done at that church in New York. But you can't just copy what the other churches do because those churches have all grown up in their own particular time and context. And so we can't pretend we're in Sydney or in New York or even in central London. What are God's church growth principles for every church, including ours? Well, here in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul's explaining how God grows his churches always and everywhere. Remember, Ephesians is... Game of football, last day of the Premier League. Let's think about football briefly. Uh, not that we never ever stop thinking about football, but you know how, let's just think of it, you know, Ephesians is a game of football, two halves, all right? Chapters one to three have celebrated God's eternal plan to gather everything together in heaven and on earth under Christ through the death of Jesus, which reconciles us to God and to one another. That's the first half. Now in chapters 4 to 6, he begins to explain how his readers must live in a church that is committed to gathering people under Christ. He begins by outlining three basic ingredients for church growth here in our passage, verses 1 to 16. This is how God grows his church. This is how he wants our church to grow. It's very simple. It's quite a complex passage, but three simple principles. Keep your unity to contribute your ministry, to grow.
grow in maturity. Say it again. Keep your unity to contribute your ministry to grow in maturity. That's how he grows churches. Firstly then, keep our unity or keeping our unity. This is verses two to six. Perhaps I could read from the passage again. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body, there's one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let me try and explain that a little. Paul is concerned for a deep unity in every local church that reflects the unity we've already been given in the heavenly church of which we're all members. See, when you become a Christian, by faith united with Christ, he's in heaven, and so we belong to the heavenly church that is expressed in local gatherings all over the world, like ours. So he's not talking here about the cooperation of God's people scattered across the world. Now that's another great kind of cooperation, and that goes on, for example, in parachurch ministries, whether they're global initiatives like missions, or national fellowships, like the FIEC, or the Anglican Mission in England, or regional groupings like the London Gospel Partnership, or an organic church planting network like our own network commission. Those are all cooperations between churches and between Christians across the world. Now, these are wonderful collaborative efforts. But Paul is concerned here with unity within each church family based upon the gospel. And he outlines three attitudes which are vital for unity, and then seven wonderful motives for trying to do it. Here are the three attitudes. First, he says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient. Being humble is not about being shy or speaking quietly. It's an attitude of the heart. It means submitting ourselves to each other in order to promote their best interests. For example, allowing somebody else's teaching or ideas or their musical talents to be celebrated ahead of our own. It means to give way to somebody else. In other words, not having an inflated opinion of ourselves, but to respect and put others first. Be humble. Next, he says being gentle. Literally means being meek. That's not about being inert doesn't mean doing nothing, but it does mean restraining our bloated sense of entitlement to be the focus of everybody else's care and attention in order to devote ourselves to caring for other people. For example, realizing that our desire for attention and care may need to be neglected because people are helping other people in their needs which we may know very little about. One of the things that can cause division in a church is when we forget that Being helped by other people in the church is not something we're entitled to. It's a gift of God's kindness and grace. If we don't understand that, then if we get missed by somebody else's care, then we'll feel all angry and upset. And when we do receive care from somebody else, we won't really appreciate it because we just thought we were entitled to it. It's really important to understand that the care and love of other people is a kindness of God. It's, it's a grace from God, and therefore we'll be grateful when we enjoy it. But sometimes it may mean that we need to be neglected while others are being cared for. That's what it means to be meek. To be patient means the compassionate long-suffering of the faults of others and being slow in seeking their rebuke. At a time when our culture has become very critical and censorious, quick to cancel other people. For example, if somebody else has been a bit unreliable or a bit lazy or demanding, or if we experience a bit less love than we have shown to other people. And it may be that that's our particular struggle. Some of us may not particularly struggle with violence or drugs or theft or promiscuity. That may not be our issue for us, for many of us perhaps. Humility and gentleness and patience, that's really hard, really hard. You see, the world encourages our self-promoting desires to be opinionated and aggressive and ambitious for ourselves and and our friends or family. 
But that kind of arrogance is a sin that strangles the growth of a church because we end up pulling in different directions. By contrast, our Lord Jesus Christ was incredibly powerful. He's God in human flesh. And yet was famously humble and gentle and patient with everybody he met. In fact, he's been incredibly humble and gentle and patient in dealing with us, hasn't he? Think of what he tolerates in us. Think of how patient he is with us. Can we not be patient with other people? Let's ask God to make us more like him. Perhaps to recognize the insecurities in our own upbringing. Question that poisonous education in being narcissistically attention-seeking. You know, look at me. Look after me. Serve me. Perhaps we can confess our selfishness to God, which makes us so demanding. And pray for his strength to treat people more kindly. For example, we could try humbly in conversation to inquire after other people's triumphs and troubles before, before we start telling them about our own. In church meetings, we could resolve to gently to allow others to have the first say and the last word. And in our church gatherings, we could try patiently to rejoice in others being welcomed and cared for instead of demanding help for ourselves. Growing Christ-like humility and gentleness and patience will enable what Paul wants here. Twin aims for the church. Firstly, bearing with one another in love. That means accepting the failures and flaws of other people because we love them. Can I tell, let you into a secret? I mean, don't, don't tell anybody else. But you're going to be disappointed if you come to our church. You're going to be disappointed in me and the other leaders. You're going to be disappointed in the other church members. At some point, you're going to be disappointed by other people. The truth is, that's the same in every church you could go to. I just want you to be ready for that. Because the issue is, how will you respond when you are disappointed? Because that's what causes disunity or unity in a church. In other words, we need to bear with one another in love. Yep, I was a bit let down at that point, but I'm going to bear with it in love because of how God has treated me. And second, he says, verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit is that special togetherness that the Holy Spirit creates in every congregation through a bond of peace, our shared experience of being adopted into God's family, at peace with God and at peace with one another. For as Paul now explains, God has already given us a spiritual unity in Christ unlike anything else in society. And it provides multiple motivations to stay together, to cooperate together. Verse four, there's one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all and in all. Paul describes the unity that each of the three persons in God creates for us. There's one Holy Spirit who's called us through the gospel into one body of the church through one hope, the shared hope of eternal life in heaven. We are going to be together in heaven for a very long time. And so we need to get along. And then there's one Lord Jesus who is proclaimed by the one faith of the Bible, symbolized by one baptism in the Holy Spirit. And there's one God and Father who is the origin and the ruler and the sustaining presence of everything and everyone in the universe. There's one God. And since God himself is a unity of persons who are diverse but equal and ordered in love for each other, so every church under Christ is to be a unity of diverse people, all equal in Christ, but ordered with different roles in sacrificial love for each other. Well, we may have a picture of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Um, is there a picture of the orchestra there? Didn't come through. Can you imagine an orchestra? Right, big orchestra. And imagine that um, the orchestra playing and the different musicians skillfully combine their talents to make beautiful music. But imagine if the string section starts to become competitive and showing off by playing faster than everybody else. Then the brass section gets aggressive and plays so loudly they totally dominate and you can't hear any of the other instruments. 
When the wind section gets so upset with all the conflict, they stop playing entirely. So the per per percussion section, they overreact, start throwing their drumsticks at the other members of the orchestra. The music will sound dreadful. The audience will quickly leave unless something changes. And the conductor needs to rebuke them sharply. The truth is that's what often happens in churches. Where people have left their local church never to return because of the shameful bitchiness and the division they witnessed when they came along to church. Now the BBC conductor would like to say to his quarrelling orchestra, stop this squabbling, you're incredibly privileged to have been chosen and assembled to play in this orchestra, to play Mozart's beautiful music. So the apostle wants to remind us, stop arguing, stop allowing yourself to be so annoyed by everybody else. You're incredibly privileged to have been chosen and gathered together in this local church to cooperate in God's stunning, beautiful plan to gather people together under Christ. Everything's not about you, it's about him. So let's be a little more humble and gentle and patient and play nicely together. Seriously, then, God says, keep your unity by being humble, gentle, and patient with each other. That's the first thing. Second thing, learning our ministry. Because the truth is, if we do keep our unity, we'll be able to learn our ministry. This is verses 7 to 12. Having emphasized the importance of unity in Christ's body for growing the church, Paul now explains the great value of diversity in the members. Look at verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Every single believer in Christ, without exception, has been given some grace in gifts of ministry from Christ as he has decided to distribute them. So if you're a Christian here, you have grace from God for serving other people. You have. It's a gift from God. You have gifts from him to contribute to the life of this church. Now, these are not for our personal satisfaction or reputation, but for enriching other people. And actually, there's great joy in being able to contribute. These gifts are not personal talents, but rather a ministry that we can offer our church family. Now, Paul explains this more fully elsewhere, for example, in 1 Corinthians 12 or Romans 12. And it means that none of us should indulge any feelings of inadequacy. Oh, I can't do anything. That's not true. We've all got something to contribute. Indeed, the church would be weakened if we don't offer our ministry because God has brought you into the church family to be yourself and to do what you can do in the common goal of bringing people under Christ. And none of us should indulge feelings of superiority because none of us has got all the gifts. Indeed, we will eventually discover how much we need the ministry of other people. We seriously need one another. We are not going to be able to grow our church without one another. The diversity of members in a church is something to be celebrated and enjoyed. And indeed, since Christ apportions the gifts, there's no point feeling envious of somebody else's gift or proud of your own gifts because they're all given by him. It's interesting, when you get to heaven, you see, we'll be approved and rewarded for our godliness, but not our gift giftedness. Jesus will be completely uninterested in how gifted we were. He gave all the gifts. There he is, he gave them to us for the service of other people. There's no reward for giftedness, only for godliness. So Paul wants to emphasize here where these gifts of ministry come from. So whether we serve by praying for other people, or maybe we read the Bible with them, or maybe we just encourage them every time we come to church. Maybe we serve on a stewarding rotor or in a children's ministry. Perhaps we lead a Bible study group. Whatever it is that we do, Paul wants to emphasize where the gifts come from. So he quotes from Psalm 68 to explain that it's the risen Christ has not only saved us, but given each of us gifts for serving other people. So this is verse 8. I have to say, by the way, this is not an easy quote. So you're going to have to have your crossword head on to see if you can sort it out. Verse 8. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who has ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Got that? Easy, yeah? Not. Well, I don't think it's easy. I think it's really, 
um, complicated, makes us think. Let me try and explain. The psalm he quotes from celebrates the victory of God in rescuing Israel from Egypt. And having rescued them, then giving his redeemed people back to the world to serve the world. Paul recognizes that that psalm was looking forward to the victory of Christ in ascending to heaven and then giving us as his people back as gifts to his churches. So we don't just have gifts. Every single one of us is a gift. You know when somebody say, you know, people say, oh, she thinks she's God's gift. If she's a Christian, she is. Oh, he thinks he's God's gift. If he's a Christian, he is. We are God's gifts to the church. So our church is not just for blessing me, like a consumer filling his basket in the supermarket. Rather, we're saved and given as gifts to bless other people by serving them. We're not meant to be consumers, we're to be contributors. Not getters, but givers. <coughs> but how do we do that then? Verse 11. It was he, that is Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. What for? To prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. In other words, the Bible teachers given by Jesus, including those foundational apostles back in the first century, who were appointed by Christ as his witnesses and empowered by his spirit to write the New Testament for us, and the original first century prophets who taught and preserved the faith until the Bible was completed, and then the evangelists who bring us to Christ, and now the pastor teachers who build us up in Christ each week, those people are given to you to train you in your ministry. Now we receive this teaching in at least four obvious places. There are prepared sermons on a Sunday from gifted, trained and experienced preachers, and then there are prepared Bible study discussions and there are training courses led by godly and gifted trained leaders in small groups. And then there are informal discussions with families or couples or flatmates or prayer triplets or regular one-to-one -one meetings. Perhaps just in an ordinary conversation after church, chatting about what that bloke said. Did you get a word of what he talked about? Not really. I think he was saying this, and you just talk about what you've heard. What an encouragement that is to somebody else who you chat to. And then, of course, there are our private devotions. You know, perhaps you download a Bible app from the, you know, the app store and you read the Bible on your way to work on the train. Or, or you can, indeed, you can play it out loud as you drive in your car. Or maybe you read the Bible for yourself for 15 minutes over your cornflakes in the morning before you go off to work. These are the four legs of a chair that provide the Bible teaching that we need. Sunday sermons, midweek small groups, conversations and personal devotions. It supports our faith. Why? to equip us for the ministry that we have to contribute to the church. You see, teachers of every kind in the church have been given, says Paul, to prepare God's people for works of service or ministry. The word means ministry or worship. In other words, to equip us, all of us, for our many different ministries that will grow and build the church. Which means all of us who are Christians are ministers. We're all ministers. We all have ministries. Our mission statement is that we witness to grow disciples for Christ. That is, all the things we do, which we describe as witness, all the ministries of our church, are for growing disciples for Christ. Because it takes the whole church to make disciples. It's a team game. Our church will never grow if you just leave it to the, the people who do the preaching. Because I don't know all your friends, and I don't know how to do countless things. If I almost know how to do nothing except a few Bible talks. I seriously need lots of other people, including everybody in this room. Our church needs everyone to get involved. It has sometimes been joked that churches are a bit like a football match. 22,000 spectators desperately needed some exercise, and 22 players desperately in need of a rest. And that is not how God wants a church to be. A few people exhausted and everybody else just watching. We really do want everyone to be involved. See, many people think of church like a football match where the spectators, the crowd of spectators, that is the congregation, come to watch the very expensive players, that is the clergy, playing the game, which is doing the ministry of preaching and leading. And many people think that's what the ministry is. 
Paul says Bible teachers are given to prepare God's people for works of service. So the whole body of Christ may be built up. In other words, it's the works of service of the congregation that builds up the church. It's not just Bible teachers who do ministry. Everyone in the church is a minister. So if our church was a football club, let's call it Church United FC, the players on the pitch are all the church members. The Bible teachers are player coaches, training them to play the game of growing disciples of all nations. We play in the style of loving God, loving each other, loving our neighbours. That's our values. And we play as a team against the world, the flesh and the devil. We invest in the youth academy to raise up young players. And we're being watched by the spectators who are the watching world of unbelieving friends, family, work colleagues, local community. And this profoundly affects the way we do church. The Bible teachers, whether employed staff or our governing elders, are not the only ministers. Rather, we're training everyone in their ministry that grows the church. We're not trying to get everybody to become a preacher. We don't need more preachers. We've got plenty of preachers. We need you to do your ministry. We don't need you to be a preacher. We need you to do your ministry. We need you to be you, to contribute what you've got, what you can do to contribute to the life of our church. And then we've got a church of hundreds of ministers, all busy doing what you can do for the Lord. So now you see, having told the Ephesians to keep your unity, to learn your ministry, he now calls them therefore to grow in maturity. This is verses 13 to 16. Jesus doesn't want our churches just to be united in diversity and busy with ministry. He wants us to grow up in maturity, to become more and more like Christ. And he uses three similar phrases to describe it. Unity in the faith, maturity, fullness in Christ. Three ways of describing the same thing, which is to be grown up. Verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. That means a shared and true understanding of God revealed in Christ as Christ is revealed in the Bible. None of us understands God perfectly, so Christ wants us to grow in our understanding. We're not to be content with remaining childishly ignorant like Peter Pan. You know Peter Pan? I just want to have fun and never grow up. And the apostle is saying, don't be like Peter Pan. You want to grow in your understanding so you mature. And then you'll be mature, he says, which means grown up spiritually, not remaining childishly undeveloped. Some, some, sadly, some people don't want to make the effort to understand difficult things like predestination. It's sad to find Christians who just want to retain childish views of guidance or angels or whatever it is. Like a grown up clutching a childhood teddy bear. Please don't be offended if you still sleep at night with a teddy bear. I mean, spiritually speaking, to stay childish is not, is not um, admirable. Apostle says we should all aspire to be mature, to grow. What does that mean? Well, it certainly means taking Bible teaching seriously. So you'll notice there are some people here in church who are making notes. Why are they making notes? Because they want to grow. They're not just sitting back here, having to snore, you know, waiting for the stories. They want to grow up. They're making notes because they're serious. And maybe it helps them stay awake. Other people read books. People read the, the passages before coming to church so they're ready to learn and then read them again after they've heard the sermon. People take books on holiday and maybe it's audio books. If you're not a great reader, just get an audio book and plug in, you know. See people riding around with Bible playing in there and, and talks. Where would you get the talks from? Well, you can look at our library of, of sermons online. Or if you don't like any of our sermons, which would be a surprise, but if you don't like any of them, anything by John Piper on the Gospel Coalition website is worth listening to. And, um, and you grow up and you mature in your understanding. Jesus doesn't want us to become academics. He does want us to grow up. And that will result in attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. See, our Lord's intention for us to grow not just in doctrinal unity, you know, we can all say the same creeds, but to become more like Christ become more and more attractive to the world as we become more and more like Christ. Verse 14, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. 
You see, some Christians do stay babies in their understanding, and therefore every time there's some kind of new false teaching that blows across the waves from some other country, and you know, there's some fantastic new thing that, you know, the Spirit brings gold teeth, or um, the Spirit is bringing this or that, and all these things. I mean, I've, I'm long enough, I've been through the years. I remember when the um, Toronto blessing came, and then the Kansas City prophets, and and the emerging churches and all kinds of crazes. And sometimes you kind of feel it's a bit like people are still playing with Barbie and Ken action dolls and then, the, and then hamsters and scooters and skateboards and then it's One Direction. You've got to, you've got to grow out of that. That's right. One Direction? Are we allowed to grow out of One Direction or do you have to stay? Who's a One Direction fan here? No one, so no one's a fan. All right, sorry. Instead of staying baby-like in our understanding, says Paul, verse 15, he says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As we contribute our ministry, we will learn together what it means to be more like Christ. He says we're to speak the truth in love, especially we're to counsel each other appropriately in how the gospel affects our lifestyle, our decisions and our attitudes. It's been a wonderful thing in recent years, I think, for the emergence of the um, Biblical Counseling UK movement. You know, Biblical Counseling UK offering lots of help with bringing the Bible to bear upon the issues that we face so that we think in a more Christ-like way. And that's to be welcomed. We do need to remember that Jesus and his spirit are the counselor that people need. And that Jesus' conversations were largely evangelistic and not just about marital bliss. And none of us will be perfect before we reach the new creation. But we do want to encourage mutual biblical conversation to counsel and encourage one another. We need to encourage mutual biblical conversation and for some people to be properly trained in biblical counselling, perhaps that's something uh, you'd like to sign up for, some training in biblical counselling. But this is not an excuse, by the way, for us to say all the hard and horrible things. You know, speaking the truth in love seems to give some people the opportunity. Uh, I just want to say some hard things to you. I'm just speaking the truth in love, of course. You know, bang! It's not the opportunity to say everything that horrible that we wanted to say to somebody because we envy them or find them frustrating. There is a censorious cancel culture at the moment that loves to judge and cancel other people. And that might be a particular temptation for those of us with therapeutic gifts, quite eager, eager to fix other people, which is a bit of a sort of power play thing. Now we need to bring people to the word of Christ for his counseling. It means lovingly discussing the spiritual truth of God's word. It means chatting evangelistically with unbelievers, not manipulating people, but helping people to understand what God has done for us in Christ. Offering biblical encouragements to other believers without being painfully sanctimonious. It's worth us asking ourselves, when did we say something encouraging to another member of the family? And perhaps when we've said 99 encouragements, then it's time maybe for a loving rebuke. But not till you've done 99 encouragements. You know, it's just worth asking, when do we actually encourage people? How could we find something encouraging to say to somebody in their walk with Jesus. See, our churches will only grow to maturity as each part does its work. We all need to get involved. So as I close, here is the prayer that our church uh, used to have on its wall before we destroyed the building. And no doubt we'll have it somewhere on a banner or something in the new church building to help and remind one another what's expected of us as members of a church. Uh, we call it the joining in prayer. Those who've been in connect groups, I think, will have come across the joining in prayer. And it's just a way of reminding ourselves of what's expected of us as we contribute our ministry to the church. It's to recognize that um, to love is to act. In other words, to love God, to love one another, to love our neighbors, will mean that we act. A stands for attend attend church and an appropriate small group. That's A. C is contribute our ministry and our money. And T is to talk to believers in church and to unbelievers out in the world. 
attend, contribute, and talk. And if we love God and each other and our neighbors, then we'll act, attend, contribute, and talk. It's just a way of summarizing the basics of how every single one of us can get involved in the life of church. And it may be as you're sitting here this evening, perhaps especially if you're new, and you're thinking, well, there's lots of things I could contribute, but nobody knows me yet. So how do I contribute? How do I get involved? How do I contribute? Uh, in which case, of course, can I say just please do talk to uh, one of the staff, so whether that's uh, Tom or myself or Ian, who welcomes all the all new believers, or talk to any of the church members and they'll point you to a member of staff or somebody else. And then you can say, look, I, is there any way I can help with this? Is there any way I can help with that? And from time to time, we have gifts questionnaires where we just ask people, what are your gifts and ministries that you can t- contribute? Because we do want everyone to get involved and to contribute your ministry so that God will grow this church to his glory. Let me read out to you the prayer and then you could think whether you want to pray in your heart. So this is how the prayer goes. It says, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, by your grace in Jesus Christ and the power of your Holy Spirit, help us prayerfully to live by your word as members of this church who love God, love each other and love our neighbors and therefore will attend regularly our Sunday congregation and an appropriate small group, it's different for all of us, contribute generously our ministry and money, and talk humbly to believers in church and unbelievers we meet. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Just to explain, this is a prayer, no one will police this. I'm not interested in us walking around checking up on each other. Rather, I want to encourage you to pray it in your heart, to be something that you want to do as you take part in our church. Because if God is going to grow our church, we really need everyone. So I'm going to pray this prayer out loud. And as you listen in, you might like to pray it in your heart and say amen at the end. All right, let's bow our heads and pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for this passage. We do pray, Lord, that you'd help us to do what we can to keep our unity by being humble and gentle and patient with one another. Help us to learn how to contribute our ministry, to do what we can with the gifts you've entrusted to us to benefit everyone else. And we do pray, Lord, that you would help us, therefore, to grow in maturity. And so we pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, by your grace in Jesus Christ and in the power of your Holy Spirit, help us prayerfully to live by your word as members of this church who love God and love each other and love our neighbours. And therefore, where we can, to attend regularly our Sunday congregation and an appropriate small group, to contribute generously our ministry and our money and to talk humbly to believers in church and to unbelievers we meet. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and for the growth of your church. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks for joining us this evening, whether you've been watching online uh, or here in person. Don't forget to get in touch with uh, any reflections you've got on the small group program, info at dundonald.org for that. Uh, and stick around outside, maybe stick a coat on um, for a chat. And to encourage one another, perhaps, with one thing that you've heard this evening from God's word. Let's pray as we close. Our loving Father in heaven, we... We thank you so much for your patience and your love towards us. We thank you that you chose us in Christ before the creation of the world and brought us into your family. And so, please, would you help us to bear with one another in love, striving for togetherness, for unity, by your spirit at work within us. Please help us as your gifts to the church to look out in seeking to bless one another, to minister to one another, in works of service and please help us to grow as we sit under your word week in week out listening and learning day by day that we might become more like Jesus we thank you for your power at work in us to this end and we ask that it might all be for the praise of your glorious grace and we ask this in Jesus name amen so glad to see you have a great week Thank you.